Hey, real, real quick question. Is the video going to matter at all? Uh, I mean, we post the video <laughs> that'll be on Facebook and YouTube, but don't, I mean, whack, don't whack off during this. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I got another monitor going, so I could. <laughs> yeah. Can we use that in the intro? The, yeah, yeah. Don't whack off. <laughs> <laughs> This episode of Bird Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Fred Minnick here with an important announcement. Join me September 21st at the Art of Bourbon, a rare bourbon auction benefiting Louisville Speed Art Museum. I'm the curator, and get this, I've tracked down the 10th bottle of Pappy. Learn more at speedmuseum.org. That's speedmuseum.org. Sterling Cut Glass is the official whiskey and tasting glass supplier to distilleries across the country and is also the official glassware of Bourbon Pursuit. They are offering free etched samples to whiskey societies nationwide. Simply email spirits at sterlingcutglass.com, include your logo, and mention Bourbon Pursuit. Take a look at their online catalog with Glen Cairns, Copitas, Rock Glasses, Decanters, and more at bourbonpursuit.com and click on the banner for Sterling Cut Glass. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit. And before we start talking about private barrels and our concerns with them, we got to go through a lot of news first. And we are in our one-week countdown before Bourbon and Beyond kicks off here in Louisville, Kentucky at Champions Park, September 22nd and 23rd. If you haven't gotten tickets yet, it's crunch time. It really is. So go to bourbonpursuit.com. Click the banner for Bourbon and Beyond. Go get your tickets. There's also the Bourbon and Beyond app that you can download so you can figure out what bourbon sessions you want to go to, what cooking sessions you want to go to, the bands you want to see, and you can get your schedule completely made out. So it's really cool. So go and check that out. The other thing that's happening is it's Bourbon Heritage Month. So that means it's a few things. One, a lot of new fall releases are starting to come out. And two, it's Kentucky Bourbon Festival Week. And if you are listening to this podcast today, we are going to be at one of our favorite events, which is a Bourbon Bonanza that's going to be taking place in Bardstown tonight. So if you're there, come say hi. We like to meet our listeners. So please come and do that. Now, if you're also going to be at Bourbon Bonanza, we have a little bit of a surprise in store for you that you get an opportunity to kind of see our, the next project and taste the next project that we're working on. And if you're also a Patreon supporter and you're part of our community, then you saw one of the teasers that we have put out this week as well. So go ahead, go check that out. I'm sure it's not going to be disappointing. Uh, well, at least I hope not because we're super excited about it. And I know from the response we've already gotten on Patreon, a lot of people are excited about it as well. Now, one of the other cool things is that Ryan got the opportunity to go to DC about a week and a half ago. And while he was there, he stopped by Jack Rose because that's what you do in DC. And he opened up the menu and there it was. It was finally there. The Bourbon Community Roundtable Buffalo Trace Barrel Pick that we have done has made it onto the menu at Jack Rose, and it's there for $9 a pour. So next time you're in D.C., make sure you go to Jack Rose and go check it out. In regards of just fall releases, Old Forrester Birthday Bourbon, as well as Michter's Toasted, has started hitting shelves across the nation. And we also have to give a special shout out to Jimmy and Eddie, who are celebrating their 101-year anniversary of combined... Uh, working years, you could say, at the distillery. Now, today's episode, we've raved about them, and we're starting to do our own, and that's private barrel picks are becoming just really the hot new ticket. It's the hot new item. And these carefully brought barrels are they're selected, they're taken into the store, and they're chosen really for a particular audience. However, you need to be figure out, you know, how sure can you be about them? Do you really trust who's picking them? Because a label said it might have been chosen by a master distiller, but does that really mean a master distiller picked it? Or was it just part of the leftovers from other barrel picks? And of course, we have to cover stickers because stickers are just the hot newness that's just happening right now. It's a podcast that, in my opinion, it's both fascinating and intriguing, and it's going to make you think about maybe twice going into an unknown store and just purchasing some random barrel pick. Now, if you want to know 
more about bourbon and everything that we do, hit that subscribe button, whether you're on YouTube or iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or wherever you get your podcast. And if you do like the show, make sure you join us, right? The community of Patreon is growing every single day. We've got things such as our own private barrel picks, your opportunity to be able to buy those bottles, as I'd mentioned, a little teaser that's coming out for even more bourbon that's going to be coming. Uh, but we've got t-shirts, hats, patches, koozies, stickers. Go check it out, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit, and you can go and help support the show and join our community. And make sure you're also following us on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We're just posting stuff all the time, so you need to figure out what we're up to and interact with us through there. And with that, enjoy this week's episode. And here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week, I want to talk about family. We recently welcomed into the world Julian Joseph Minnick. As I held my second son in my arms, my heart couldn't have been more filled with love. And one of the first things his mama asked for while in recovery, where's the old Forster birthday bourbon? Of course, she couldn't drink it because of the medication and, well, you know, truthfully, I later accidentally broke the bottle. But, you know, that's another story. The point to this story is the deep family connection bourbon brings out. My family was just minutes away from the delivery room, and Mama was already talking about bourbon. I'm sure you have a story like that, too. Bourbon runs deep in our blood, and it evokes a certain lifestyle and cultural passion you simply do not find with other spirits. And there's no greater example of this than with Freddie Johnson, the famous tour guide at the Buffalo Trace Distillery. Johnson joined the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame this week with fellow inductees Max Shapira, who earned the Lifetime Achievement Award. He's the CEO of Heaven Hill. Pierce Lyons, the founder of Altac, who passed away in March. And Matthew Shattuck, the Bean Suntory CEO. All of these men are extremely deserving. But there's something special about Freddie's story that just pulls on your heartstrings. He's the first African-American and tour guide to be ducted into the Bourbon Hall of Fame, and he's arguably the face of the Buffalo Trace Distillery because of the passion his father, a leak hunter, instilled in him. When you take a tour with Freddie, you feel the passion, the history, and the knowledge seeping out of his words. If you've never taken a tour with him, you must schedule your trip immediately and book Freddie for what will be an incredible experience. The thing that always stands out with Freddie is just how he reveres his father, Jimmy Johnson, who became the first African-American warehouse supervisor in a Kentucky distillery. Freddie often tears up when talking about his father, especially when he cared for him in his final years. That pride, that sense of family is carried through at Buffalo Trace, whose CEO Mark Brown speaks of the Johnson family as if they were his family. That's because they are. And that's what bourbon does. It brings us together. I dream of one day sharing the bourbon passion with my two boys. And I hope that they can think of me as Freddie has always thought of his father. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, my first issue of Bourbon Plus drops soon. Make sure you subscribe at bourbonplus.com. And follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Fred Minnick. If you've got an idea for Above the Char, hit me up. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny and Ryan here with you recording a good episode because, you know, this is something that Ryan always talks about. And I know it's going to be near and dear to his heart because today's we all focused on private barrel selections and really to be focused around some of the concerns and some things you need to know about as a consumer when you're going to be going into a store and buying a barrel. So, or should I say buying a bottle? We'll, we'll be the ones buying the barrel, yeah. I guess. So, Ryan, I guess kind of talk a little bit about your love affair with single barrels and why you always call them about the, the unicorns of the world. Yeah, so in this new bourbon, I guess, economy, uh, limited editions, I'm too lazy to go deal with them. I'm not going to camp. I'm not going to hunt. I'm not – it's just impossible here in Louisville, Kentucky. So – my new unicorns and the chase is uh, private barrel selections from stores, uh, from bird groups, uh, just wherever I can find them. Cause I think those are where the true gems are. 
And so I'm super excited because, like you said, this is my new passion because the limited releases, I'm kind of over them. They're lame. Well, I mean, not only that is there is a, a, a wide amount of stuff that you can get. I, mean, I think that you could easily spend uh, any day, 365 days of Louisville, and every single day you could probably find a different single barrel store pick that's around here just because mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the mass amount of stores. And I think that the allocations that some of these stores get. So you, you have your variable pick. I guess, Ryan, first off, um, you know, if you had the choice, what's going to be your, your pick of choice when you go to a store? And if you see something that's a single barrel, what do you what do you gravitate towards? I mean, probably first choice is a Four Roses. I mean, that's because to me, I've been on barrel picks and Four Roses gives you the most probably diverse selection and allows you to pick the most, uh, gives you the most choices, I guess. And that, that those seem to be the most unique to me um, from there. Uh Probably old Weller store picks are going to be – the antiques are going to be the next choice. I mean, that's that's kind of getting played out and burnt out to where now those are even, like, become limited releases, and now it's become so absurd that you yeah, have to kind of hunt you, and camp for those. So now – You've got eight minutes to get to the store, right? Yeah. Exactly. So any more – I mean, the, the 1792 foolproof ones have been pretty good um, that I've had the store picks, but probably Four Roses will be my – there, there's just not a ton out there. I mean, the used to be old scouts, you know, were the ones to go to and some of the MGPs, but now those have kind of dried up. So it's, you know, you just got to, it's roses are always easily available, but I do love those like old scouts, MGPs, the, and the, the full proofs are kind of coming around for me as well. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a good one. I think we'll uh, we'll talk about that here as we go. So let's let's go ahead and take a moment and introduce our guests tonight. So tonight we have Brett Atlas and Luke Castle. Both of these gentlemen are contributors to bourbonandbanter.com. So gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Appreciate it. So before we kick it off, I, I think we should go ahead and just let you all introduce just a little bit about yourself. We typically always ask, you know, like what was your first uh, run in with bourbon or or what was some of those first memories but you know go ahead and you can just take it on whatever direction you want brett we'll we'll leave with you my my first real uh introduction to bourbon was my freshman year in college probably around 1991 uh my freshman uh initiation into my fraternity uh as a pledge uh to bring up a tray of shots and at that time it was wild turkey 101 and here, do six shots. And I did. And, you know, we go through and you don't drink it again for three years because it was disgusting. And now that bottom shelf swill is uh, being chased by everyone, including myself. It's a few hundred dollars a bottle at that early 90s turkey. So that's where it kind of all started for me. And I got back into it right after college. And uh, uh, it's kind of been a passion ever since. Yeah, I think me and you kind of share a history there because I didn't have bourbon until I went to college as well. And so it was sort of like the, the kicking off point for me too, where it, I started off there and then it just didn't stop. No, it's great. Uh, it's, it's just been a lot of fun and it continues to be, I mean, I know people get aggravated with it, but I just love it. <laughs> Sounds good. So Luke, go ahead, take it over. Yeah. Similar. Uh, I could go think back to uh, college and drink a Jim Beam at Cokes and uh, whatever got the job done for uh, your night out back then after college, I actually gravitated more to wine more of a defense mechanism. I entertain a lot for work. Had to learn my way around the wine menu, so I didn't get uh, taken advantage of, I guess. But uh, after dinner, drinks, having a whiskey here and there. Um, Maker's Mark, probably the first bourbon that I would consider to be more high-end. And then got into a group of buddies here in Minneapolis where we did a brown liquor night once a quarter. And started a scotch boat, kind of gravitated to other things. And I can remember in 2011, uh, we decided we were going to try drinking bourbon that night. And Pappy had just been released, so there was six guys in the group. We each picked a, uh, a vintage to buy, and we all went out and bought a bottle of each of the Pappies and drank it all that night. So, well, how long ago then, was this then? 2011. Oh, okay. So it was still yeah. attainable back then. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you can walk in and sit on the shelf. Yeah, it totally sat there. So we drank it all. Like, I, I don't think there was literally anything left in any of those bottles that night. And, you know, I kind of spoiled, but that was kind of my first foray into the higher end stuff. Uh, Blanton's uh, for a lot of people is the gateway. I would say that was one for me as well. Right. It, so I guess after that one night, I mean, I, I don't know about you, at least I still get a hangover when I drink Pappy. So was your, was your head killing you if you were crushing every single bottle in the lineup? Probably. 
<laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. It was, it was a while ago, right? Yeah. So it can put a lot away. <laughs> I know That's, it'd be ideal if these expensive bourbons didn't give you hangovers, you know, like it still hurts is just as bad as the cheap stuff. Quality doesn't help. They weren't that, that expensive yeah. back then. I, I actually went, it was around that time. I went to the store. I told the store to get this Pappy Van Winkle I read about back in, I think 2010. And, and I went over there when it came in and they, they had a bunch of that. They sold out of everything else, but they had a whole shelf full of that squat bottle 10. And I got so mad that I bought one bottle and I left the rest all on the shelf. And I came home and I and I just started mixing drinks with it and pouring it over ice and just cursing the bottle. And obviously, you know, now that's one that's really sought after too. So we all make mistakes. Oh yeah. There's we could have a whole episode on like you know, missed opportunities or like stuff we just passed on. It's it's sickening. Oh, bourbon regrets. Absolutely. Yeah, bourbon regrets, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Coming next week. Probably. <laughs> Right, with all these other things. And I, I guess that'll probably lead into something we're talking about tonight too, because I'm sure there are some of those store picks that are out there. You always say, I wish I would have bought more of them or uh, you wish uh, you had a little bit of FOMO to think that I, that I pass not getting that one too. So I think that'll let it lead into our discussion. So back on episode 124, we had actually covered creating a barrel picking group with Eddie Noel, the bourbon cartel. And we talked about how, you know, individual barrel picks, uh, you know, talked about it before, but tonight we're really going to take up more of a, of a deep dive into it. So I, I kind of want to just gauge you all, you know, Ryan talked about a little bit, but in your opinion, what makes barrel picks more special than their standard bottling counterparts? Well, I, for me, I think D- Dave Perkins from High West said it best that bourbon drinkers usually want two things, something they've never had and something they can't get. And private <laughs> picks offer both of those. Uh, and they're really limited editions. They're, you get 10,000 bottles sometimes in a, in a wide limited release that everyone chases after. Whereas, you know, a private barrel, you may get 150, 180 bottles. And, and uh, you know, and there's even a category of ultra rare within the rare, you know, the Elmer T. Lee uh, store picks, the, the Van Winkle store picks, ones that they just don't do anymore. And those are, those are truly uh, ultra limited. And, you know, I think that with a, with a private pick, and you know what you get when you buy it on the shelf, but if they're picked well, you're going to get something off profile. You're going to get something unique. And then, uh, you know, when you consider now the the demand kind of, in my opinion, affecting the quality of some of these things, you know, Luke had mentioned Blanton's earlier. I mean, I loved Blanton's and I, for me, it hasn't really been the same lately, but I, I think a good, I just went recently and did a Blanton's pick and, you know, it's an on profile pick. Yes. And it's a great Blanton's, which in this day and age, in this market, that's special. If you can find a really good plant out there. So um, that's kind of where I come at from this. And that's what makes them sort of special for me. What about you, Luke? What do you, what do you kind of think? Why, why do you think single barrels sort of stand out more than just something? I mean, whether it's just a standard, say, Russell's Reserve or Buffalo Trace, you know, something that's an everyday shelf item. However, you see the opportunity to store gets in a single barrel. Like, why would you gravitate towards that one versus something that is just pretty standard? Yeah, I, mean, I don't just automatically buy it. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> if if it's a store pick, it, I got to know who did it, really. Uh, you know, Brett just went on this great pick. I trust his palate 100%. I've, we've had a lot of pours together. So I know that he's going to pick a good barrel. So whatever, if he's involved with it, I'm interested. Um, but if you walk into a grocery store where the store manager maybe got sent three random samples and maybe didn't even bother drinking him, just picked one, um, I'm probably not going to buy it. Uh, unless they offer it up first as a sample. Um, and then last, you know, just a, a store manager, a, a owner that is a good store, um, kind of spoiled here in Minnesota, uh, Ace Spirits, who you interviewed, um, Lewis, a couple months ago. Uh, he knows what he's doing. He goes to Kentucky all the time. If he gets a barrel in, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be good. So for me, it's the opportunity to kind of steal the palate of the people that know what the heck they're doing. There was a good question that actually came in from from somebody on the chat, and they uh, they said, "Are barrel picks actually always better than standard releases?" You know, I, I guess I kind of hyped it up, and I just said, "You know, they're always be better." Like you always <laughs> this, but I mean, it is there a certain time when, yeah, like it's something that just tastes like crap. Like is that is that a is that a thing that happens? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah, saying I I once had a pick that I was so excited to have that was so bad that three people left my house to go home and get their standard releases to make sure they were drinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell us about that. What, what yeah. was it? I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> oh, come on. You can't leave us hanging like that. Uh, it was, uh, it, it was a, a, a Buffalo trace pick. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not going to say it's, it hasn't happened before. I, we actually had a sample sent in from somebody who actually, uh, we did it blind. Ryan and I both did. And we were tasting it. We were like, we, is this a rye? Like, what is this thing? It's the most cra- crazy thing. It was just a standard Buffalo Trace, or it was a, it was an off pri- off profile Buffalo Trace that was yeah, picked by Cork and Bottle. Yeah. Ever had. Yeah. We, we had no idea. But so, yeah, it, it, it does happen. You can go way off profile sometimes, and it's a double edged sword. Yeah, and I, and I've had it happen too, where you you pick them, and you think you you got this great pick, and then when it comes, you're just like, oh, this is not uh, what I was remembering it being. Because and mostly it happens with the ones that get proofed down, you know, because you're picking it barrel proof, and then you're trying to manipulate it to where it's the same proof as the bottling, and so that can kind of throw it off, and then. Also, too, sometimes when you're in those warehouses, it's like cold and like you're just the whole experience like takes over your senses and everything tastes good. And then you get it back and you're like, oh, this is not what I was <laughs> envisioning from when I remember. And, you know, you get a little buzz. So your your palate's probably a little thrown off as well. <laughs> you know, Luke, you had mentioned in talking about uh, Lewis at A Spirits and, and saying, you know, you trust a, a certain store. So I guess that kind of leads into... How do you know if you're if you're going to choose a single barrel from somewhere? Like, how, how do you how do you gauge that? I mean, is there is there a level of trust you have to have with the store owner? Is it something that you have to just you know gamble with sometime and then hopefully it works? And then after that, you can become a repeat customer. So what's what's the the thought process behind that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think you know you got to trust the people doing the actual picking. Did they go there? Did they take samples in the store? Um, you know, if they'll let you open it, uh, Ace always has their stuff open so they'll, you could try it before you buy it. And I think a lot of stores are moving that direction. I think that's really important. Um, but again, I, I just don't buy blind from places that I don't trust and they won't let me try it first. So that, that's the biggest part. I think there's a couple of questions you have to ask. I mean, the, one thing people don't really realize is, you know, there's a, there's a grocery store chain that, that's done some really good picks, but they also the majority of their picks, they're not allowed to taste them anymore. And people don't know that. So they have to pick, do their picks by smell, but people don't know that. And then there's, uh, that's for the whole chain. But if an individual store does a barrel pick, they actually will do it themselves and they'll taste it. But, but you're not going to know the difference. I mean, I'd sure like to know if I was buying a, a, a private pick, how it was selected. And, and the other thing I think that's really key is, is to ask those questions. I mean, there's a, I, I know liquor stores where they get the samples from the distributor. You know, they get they get a they get a sample kit sent to them. They have to pick the best of three, and they think they've done a great job. What they may not realize is those barrels may have been rejected by a bunch of people who've gone to the distillery that have passed over those barrels. Those, those, those sample packs have gone out to other stores who've said no thanks. I mean, you just you really have to know. I, I would just ask the store, how did you do it? Who tasted it? Um, you know, how many picks do you do a year? I mean, if they don't do many picks a year, they're probably getting taken advantage of by their distributor because they'll do it every chance they get, um, you know, and, and do they go to the distillery? Have you visited the distillery? Do you have a relationship there? Have you gone to do a bar- barrel pick in a warehouse before? And those are the questions you can just ask them. And then you can't always, you can't always taste it. I found that out. I mean, not everybody has a tasting license. So I, I, while I will ask, I mean, they'll, usually they'll let you try it if they're proud of it, but sometimes they're not allowed to. Yeah. And one thing people got to remember too is that, these liquor stores want you to buy these private barrel picks because they have a bigger margin on them. They're paying the same exact cost as, you know, for a standard four rows, a single barrel or whatever, but they're able to mark it up more because it's a special release. So they're going to push you towards these. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind too. It, so I, I guess another question to ask you there, Brett, and I think you, you kind of triggered something too, was if, if a store is doing this and, and say they do have samples shipped to them, I mean, is it, is it, 99% of the time, do you really think it's something that are just rejects? Um, and then if they can't make it to the distillery, like what other options do they have? Well, what, for starters, I would ask them, do you ever say no to a pick? I mean, I, I would have more respect for a store that gets samples handed to them and they say, no, thanks. We couldn't find one we want. So that's something I'd want to know. Um, I think some options are, I know for Four Roses, uh, at least in Nebraska, if you if you want to do a barrel proof pick, you have two options. You can either go to the distillery or you can have, you know, the master distiller there, Brent Elliott, pick it for you. Um, those are your two options. Otherwise, you get the three samples and you get 100 proof four roses, which 
you know, can be fine. I was at the gift shop recently. They had a hundred proof pick. I would prefer not to have a hundred proof pick. I'd like something a little higher. Um, but, but you know, those are basically, that's it. I mean, those are your options. Luke, what do you think? Yeah, I like those questions, but, uh, um, you know, it all comes down to, is it good or is it not? And not everything that, not every store is good at it. Um, I helped a local here last week pick a 1792 single barrel. They got three samples sent. One of them was good. The other two were not good. And uh, they actually, the distributor was trying to push them to not even take samples, just to let the master distiller pick for them. <laughs> and I was like, you know, you got to do what you got to do. I understand you're running a business. You got to make a profit, but you should always take the option to do it. And so we did, and it ended up being better, I think. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there, most of these places that are trying to get into it today, I think that really matters as well. The stores that we all know, the picks that we've had, the private barrel groups that we have all tried from, have been doing it for years. And so they get first crack. They're usually in there the first quarter of the year, so they're not going to get the leftovers. And they're going to get options that you don't get later in the year. And that these newer shops are like, well, I'll just take whatever you got because I'm happy to put my sticker on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can attest to that because when Kenny and I went with Reed and Emerald from 17B, I mean, they rolled out like the whole basically warehouse, like whatever you want, you know. And then I've been with other store owners and they roll out like three or four, you know, like here you go. And it is amazing how they kind of, you know, based on the relationships and how long they've been doing it, what kind of offerings you're even available to pick. And Luke, I guess another question to to your um, your response there when you were picking the seventeen ninety two. I mean, is is three samples really enough to really gauge off of? I mean, you said you really had you had the, at, you had a thirty three percent chance of doing good, right? Uh, I mean, if if they were giving you seven or eight, I'm sure you wouldn't have said no. But I mean, is three really enough to to come away with something in your opinion? It's tough. I mean, because if you get three bad ones, what do you do? I mean, if you're <laughs> especially if you're a newer store. And you don't want to say no because you just want to get into the barrel program so you can kind of build a reputation. So you're just going to take whatever you can get. Fortunately, we did get one good one. Uh, but if I don't know what they would have done if all three would have been bad. You know, for the most part, though, even if you go to a distillery, sometimes they only wheel out three barrels for you unless you yeah. have a connection and you can get that fourth barrel. Or sometimes you get lucky. And I think it, Wild Turkey, I think, just lets you go through as many as you want, right? So not everyone's like that. Yeah, seventeen ninety two. The the Sazerac company they have kind of really fine tuned to where it's like three barrels. It's very systemized, very systematic. Like it's not very like, hey, go chase what you want, you know, whatever. It's so you're kind of limited on what you can pick. I think they, I think they want you out of their, they want you out of their sandbox as soon as possible. Is probably oh, what yeah. it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so Brett, this kind of goes back to something that uh, I guess Luke, you were kind of saying it too when you know, you say, well, let's just let the master distiller pick. You know, I, I think this is something that people should be cautious of when you go to a store and you do see that sticker that says selected by Harlan Wheatley or selected by Brent Elliott or selected by master distiller, wherever, right? I mean, kind of kind of give your opinion on whether you should be a little bit more concerned when you see that uh, rather than, you know, if a store or a person puts their, uh, you know, their faith behind it. Well, why, why do I care that a master distiller selected a barrel? I, I, you know, I will assume that he could select any barrel if he's in the warehouse that day. I, master distillers, is, they, they've released plenty of whiskeys I haven't liked. So just because they like it, I, that's wonderful. But, you know, I've said this before, even if someone has a palate designed by NASA and blessed by the Pope, it, if I don't like the whiskey, what does that mean? What does that do for me? So I think that at the end of the day, you know, I, I, yeah, do I trust Brent Elliott's palette? Sure, I do. Does that mean that I like everything he puts out? No. So if I see a sticker that says Brent Elliott selected it or a sticker that said Luke Castle selected it, I, it's not an automatic which one I'm going to pick. So I think, I think people need to be really careful of that. That, you know, I think if there's one thing to learn in all of this, it's, it's that palettes are subjective. I, I think that I've had, you know, I've had people whose palettes I trust who, do many, many barrel picks a year. I mean, I've had private picks that I thought were incredible and wildly disappointing by the same groups and the same people. Uh, I, I don't think, I think people are making a big mistake if they run out uh, and pluck a lot of money down on something just because everybody's chasing this barrel that sold out in two days. I, I, that doesn't mean you're going to like it. Trust me. What if it has a burn pursuit sticker on it? 
It's <laughs> sold out. It's sold. It's sold out. <laughs> but no, I'd the, buy one of them. <laughs> here, here's another thing too. Like most people don't realize, they think the master distillers picks everything. They don't. It's all tasting panels. You know, there's, you know, sometimes 10, 20 people on these panels that pick things. So it might not even be picked by him. You know, it's just kind of a sticker. You know, you throw on there. But anyways, side note. Yeah, I mean, we've we've talked about it before on the show that these could also be barrels. They, I mean, I, do you really? I mean, honestly, I mean, Luke, I'll ask you: Do you really think the master distiller is sitting there and going, "Okay, like ABC Liquors on Route 45 <laughs> and somewhere in Middle of Florida, like I'm going to choose a good one for you"? Or are they just like, just fucking give them sample eight nine <laughs> eight six? Like, what 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 do you think, Luke? I I think they want to get you out of their face. I mean, I, there's some guys that really truly enjoyed. Uh, got to pick a barrel last year with Eddie Russell. He was still into it. It seemed like he was excited to be there. He's a really nice guy. I'm actually drinking a Russell's pick. I don't know if you can see it on the podcast. This is your Same guys. Here. Same this here. Is, uh, bourbon Same pursuit right thing. there. Newbies. Um, so I think Eddie still likes it, and I think he's uh, he enjoys it. But I've seen other places where you're getting like the regional sales guy that's just like, all right, I got a date or a tea time here, and can you hurry this up? <laughs> For sure. You can't get those tea times back. <laughs> that's a problem um so there's a question from michael urato he said i have not had that many store picks but from my experience it seems like a single store pick is usually better when it comes from a major chain or a state-run liquor outlet uh rather than something that's relatively small would you all agree or disagree yeah i don't think you can say that but at, at the end of the day somebody picked it and whether it's one person or a panel of people or whether, you know, whether it's for a chain or not a chain, I, I it, it, somebody picked that barrel. So I don't think you can, I, I think whether, you know, Ryan picks one, you know, Luke picked one, I picked one. I mean, it doesn't matter. I, I think somebody picked the barrel. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. But do you trust that the manager for a region for total wine cares about getting a great barrel and really building a reputation? Or do you trust that Jamie Ferris at Lincoln Road is worried about that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's very true. I mean, you you see store store picks come in from yeah, Liquor Barn, Total Wine, uh, ABC. I mean, you name them. But who is actually picking those? And and not only that is who are the ones that actually work at these particular stores that they enjoy bourbon and whiskey as a passion, right? Um, and I think that's another thing you have to look for in your liquor store owners is 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 what they do an actual passion or is it a, is it a means to an end for them, right? Uh, of actually just putting, providing for their family, right? They realize or they can sell just another to do on their list, you know, yeah. well, got to pick one. <laughs> Let's, but I'll say from my experience, the, the picks I've had from the bigger outlets have usually don't live up to the smaller retail or the smaller stores with people that care about it. That's just from my experience. And mine too. I, when I see a big chain or a big store name, I, my first reaction is, oh, I'm not going to like that, whether yeah. that's fair or not. And uh, the, my territory got reconfigured and it originally had Mississippi in it. When it got taken away, I was disappointed because I wanted to go to Hattiesburg because I've never been to the Lincoln Road Package Store. <laughs> we can make some introductions. I'm sure Jamie can ship you something, right? Oh, I'm in some groups with him. We're good. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, uh, you know, when we talk about you, you, Luke, you'd brought it up already. We talk about groups, right? I mean, we, we had talked to, you know, we had Eddie Noel talk about the bourbon cartel. I know you guys are in a few different groups, uh, bourbon crusaders and some other ones. So kind of talk about what it means to have a special group of people doing the picking for the barrel rather than saying just a regular store going off and doing it. This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Sterling Cut Glass is the official whiskey and tasting glass supplier to distilleries across the country and is also the official glassware of Bourbon Pursuit. Sterling has contracted with the finest European crystal factories to bring the best quality glassware into their Kentucky warehouse and production facility. If you've been following us on social media, you'll see how their deep etched glassware is truly the best in the industry. I know because I searched up and down the internet to find out who was the best. Come to find out, Sterling Cut Glass supplies almost all the distilleries on the bourbon trail, and they're also the official glassware of the PGA Tournament and the Kentucky Derby. Make your logo shine on Capita nosing glasses, Glen Cairns, Neat Tasters, Rocks, Tumblers, and more. They're offering free etched samples to whiskey societies nationwide. 
Simply email spirits at sterlingcutglass.com, include your logo, and mention Bourbon Pursuit. Take a look at their online catalog by going to bourbonpursuit.com and clicking on the banner for Sterling Cut Glass. The world's biggest bourbon, music, and food festival is back. Bourbon and Beyond 2018 with Sting, John Mayer, Robert Plant, and the Sensational Spaceship. Vinny Kravitz. Counting Crows, David Byrne, Cheryl Crow, Brian Setzer, Kaleo, Government Mule, Kev Moe, and so much more. Bourbon and Beyond is back. The celebration of the spirit and soul of Kentucky, September 22nd and 23rd at Champions Park. The world's top bourbons paired with celebrity chefs, Louisville's top restaurants, and iconic musicians. With Sting, John Mayer, Robert Plant, and the sensational space shifters, Lenny Kravitz, and Beyond. For all the details, go to bourbonandbeyond.com. Bourbon and Beyond 2018, September 22nd and 23rd at Champions Park. So kind of talk about what it means to have a special group of people doing it, picking for the barrel, rather than saying just a regular store going off and doing it. What? First, I think it's I think it's fantastic. It's an experience that I think everybody should, if you can, if you're really into bourbon, whether you're in a picking group or not, you ought to at some point go to a distillery with somebody who's got experience and just go through that with them. Um, I think you learn a lot. I think you you, you kind of once you see how the process is done, I think you have a, a greater appreciation for what you're actually buying. Um, I think that it it raises the game of everyone around you. I think when you have people who've got experience, I also think it can create some confusion too. And I think that, you know, we kind of talked about this off air a little bit earlier that, you know, you've got, you've got, and, and you were just on a pit, Kenny. So, you know, you, 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 you got people there whose opinions you trust and who know their stuff, but they all have different palates, whether you like it or not. And, you know, you go through and the more people you bring in, the more you know, the divergent opinions you're going to have, and and if you you can always throw out one barrel. I, I've never been on a pick where you can, where everyone can't agree to toss one of the three barrels. Say, when you get down to those other two, you know you've got you know I, I've been there where you really like one, but more people like the other, so you kind of have to sit there and go, well, I like them both. I love this one. Maybe this one's better. I don't know, and you start questioning your own taste and. So what you come up with is you wind up with a consensus a lot of the time. And, you know, it's not always a home run like you think it is. And it's rarely, it's rarely a consensus opinion. And I think we, I was on a pick once where there were two people whose palates probably were more respected than anybody else's. And it was like, say, ten, nine or 10 people picked one barrel and the other two picked the second barrel. And the two that picked the second barrel, we were all kind of like, ah, did we make a mistake? So, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think that um, I think it's I think it's it's impressive. I do think that some of the groups, and I may be biased in this, generally do better picks than others for me. Um, and I think that's probably true for everyone. I think whatever group you're in, you're going to love the pick. I mean, and nobody comes out. You don't hear anybody talking about their picks like, oh, it was just okay, right? Everyone thinks their picks are amazing, and 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 they, you know, everyone on the internet should be chasing after them, and that's just the way it is. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's a special experience. Um, I think there's a lot of camaraderie. There's a lot of things that can be learned. And I, and I think there's, uh, I think, I think it's something everybody should try and do at some point. Yeah. I mean, I think it is a great experience and I think we'll, we'll talk about the experience here in a little bit, because we had a few questions rolling about, uh, you know, some other questions, uh, you know, regarding that, but Luke, I kind of want to get, get your idea on that as well. I mean, do you, do you think that special groups that go in for barrel picks are, um, you know, do they, do they have an advantage? Um, and as well as, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll twist it and I'll ask you a different question is that, do you think it is more beneficial for a store to sit there and say, I'm going to go and try to find the right people that are maybe in the Louisville area, or maybe that, uh, have the taste palette or the palettes that, um, that are pretty well known to actually go and pick these barrels for me because, uh, I'm just a liquor store owner. Like I'm not, not a whiskey connoisseur by any means. So, what, what do you, do you think that's a, that's a good avenue that liquor stores should be looking at as well? Yeah, totally. I mean, especially, I mean, look, we're in a bourbon boom right now. And if it says small batch or special release or whatever, it flies off the shelf and 
gets flipped five seconds later for four times what people paid for it. And, and I'm not trying to encourage that behavior, but if you're a, if I was a liquor store owner today and I had to support my family on it, I would certainly want to try to hype my barrel and make it more popular and draw people into my store. And one of the ways you could do that really easily is to find four bourbon nerds like us. Uh, maybe we should group, form our own little group. Here. I'm really cool. I'm yeah. Not really. <laughs> 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 Everybody except for Ryan then. And, <laughs> uh, and say, look, I, I had these guys that know what they're doing. Pick this barrel for me. You should come into my store and get it. I think I think that's a smart business decision right now. And, you know, regardless if they actually pick a better barrel, which I think we would, but uh, I think that's just a smart business play. Yeah. And I'll, I'll want, I just want to add a, one thing to that. My So as I do some picks for a store owner here locally and – one thing that's hard with him is that I'm a whiskey geek. My palate is, you know, much, I'm looking for certain things. Whereas he, when we pick barrels, he's like, well, that might be good for whiskey geeks, but I need this to sell to everyday folks. And so I've, we've passed up on like two or three that I just like were blown away by, but he thought these would be better sellers for his, you know, for his uh, patrons. So um, you got to take that into account too, that, store owners are going to be like, what's going to sell to my owners. Whereas a bourbon groups going to be kind of like more geared toward us geeks. So they're going to get kind of more of those crazier off profile picks that we'd like. Brett, I, see, make it, I was going to say, I see you shaking I, your head, man. You, you, you're you're getting sort of firing away. No, cause I, I've been, I've been there before Ryan and I, you know, I, I I've been sitting there and I've heard this. I, I love this one, but my customers would want that one. And, yeah. You know, I think you have to, you got to be willing to take your customers on that journey with you, or you're never going to have the reputation of somebody who does something special. Yep. I mean, anybody you want to pick it, you want, you want to come up with a pick that appeals to everyone, pick something really sweet. Cause that's what, you know, every, you know, novice bourbon drinker just wants something sweet and something nice. But I think that you, you have to be willing to say, if you're, if you own a liquor store and you like whiskey and you find something, you go, that is different. That is awesome. I don't know if my, if my, if my customers will like it, get it. I mean, let them trust you and then build a reputation that way. Otherwise, you're just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. I, I, I've heard that, that argument plenty of times when they say, you know, we've got to find a barrel that fits my customer's palate. But it's like, like your customers come in and they, they buy standard stuff off the shelf. Uh, your customers come in and you, if, if you're getting a barrel and you're getting 150, 200 bottles, do you really think you're going to sit there and – you know, make sure that everyone gets a, you know, a, a, a fair shot here or gets, gets some sort of special, treat. it's just, it's impossible. Right. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that, I think that's a, it is a bad mentality for stores to go in and think like, like it's, and put it, Luke, you said it best. We're in a boom. You think this is not going to sell. Like you put something out there that's going to be a little bit crazy or different. And people are going to be like, Oh, nope, it's going to sit like it's bourbon, man. It's, it's not going to sit no, for yeah. long. No. And you got to think about it from the long-term perspective. Again, if you're a store owner of, yes, I want to sell this whole barrel. The sooner I sell it, the more money I make faster, I guess. But if you help educate the consumer, especially today's consumer, bring them along in their journey, uh, you not only you don't have a customer anymore, you have a client that's somebody that's going to be with you for a long time. So if you take them from Basil Hayden's to Blanton's to a higher proof store pick that's barreled at you know, 117, 120 proof, and you've coached them along the way, they're going to buy everything from you now. They're going to come buy their vodka from you and their beer and their wine too. So um, I think you can build more than just a bourbon consumer. And that's what these stores really should be going for. And most of the smart ones are. Yeah. Smart. Make it a, a real rounded out individual, right? Exactly. Only the more you consume, the more round you will actually get, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, for beer drinker. Yeah, yeah. Especially for those beer drinkers. So I guess when we're talking about the hype, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit. So we should probably move into a subject that is made itself a little bit more pronounced probably in the past year and a half. And that's the fact that people put aftermarket stickers on their bottles. So Brett, I see you. Smile. I, I kind of want to, I kind of want to get your idea. Like, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Has this actually created a, a false sense of want in the market like what, what is, what's your thought behind this are, are you talking about the last year and a half or the last week and a half <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's everywhere i just remember i just remember about a year year and a half ago i mean it, it started really coming up but man alive 
I mean, shit, don't be wrong. I'm, I'm guilty too. Right. We just, we did a pick and I threw a sticker on there. Right. Like I want to be part of the cool kids too. So <laughs> what, what's your kind of thought on that? I love them. I think they're great. I, I, I think as long as they're not offensive and they're not untruthful, I, who cares? There's so much fun. I've seen, I mean, there's some great ones out there. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a nod to somebody who picked it. There's a nod to somebody who couldn't be on the pick. There's a superhero one. There's movie ones. There's, I mean, they can be terrific. And I think they really, you know, listen, at the end of the day, for, 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 for us on this and for a lot of people listening, you know, we want great picks to drink. For, for most people, though, these are baseball cards. And, and you need, you know, having one sticker on one versus one on the other, I got to collect this one because this has a, a picture of a character in a superhero movie. Or, or this makes fun of some guy in the bourbon community who, you know, none of my friends are going to know, but my online buddies who I've never met, who I talk to more than my wife, they'll all know. <laughs> you know? So, so that, I think they're terrific. I, I hope they don't go away. And I think the distillers are doing the right thing by allowing them. But I do think that at times they've gone over the line. And I think that, you know, as long as they're within the bounds of good taste, I think they're terrific. Look yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the folks that seem to be doing them are more the private barrel picking groups. It's not the liquor stores that are doing it. And I think the guys that really get into it and collect these things and drink them and participate, it's almost like a nod to the fact that they're not going to, like Ryan was talking about before, I'm not going to go stand in line and chase the, the old unicorns anymore. So these are my unicorns now. And it's my way to kind of poke fun of that other stuff. And it kind of, because at the end of the day, it's just bourbon that we're drinking and having a good time. So if we could put a fun, goofy sticker on there, let's do it. <laughs> uh, so I guess we didn't, we didn't take the other other part of that. I mean, do you, do you think that some of these are creating some sort of uh, false sense of demand? Because, I mean, let's, let's just take a, a regular pick that somebody in some liquor store in Minnesota picked or, or Wisconsin or Iowa and then you've got Jaws, right? We've, we've all seen Jaws or, uh, you know, uh, the greatest uh, with the Muhammad Ali tribute one. Like, it, by by your very nature, you're just attracted to those ones. However... Some chick with a beard on her face. Or, yeah, the bearded lady, right? I mean, that's, what, you know, giving props to even, like, the, the Smooth Ambler one that came out. So what do you, what do you, do you think that, are people just idiots that they think that just because there's a sticker on the side, it's worth more? We're talking about bourbon here, Kenny. Are yes. you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> is Perception anything crazy? reality? Well, I think it, it, at the end of the day, is it any good? I mean, I'm I'm looking over my shoulder right now, and there's a bottle of Buffalo Trace in an auction that's going for $165. Just Buffalo <laughs> Trace. Mm-hmm. So, that's that's and the it's bourbon really- bottle in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wish. <laughs> Look, and I know the guys who picked it. They have they've done hundreds and hundreds of picks. I, I'm sure it's good. I might have a couple of bottles coming to me on a cost plus ship basis. So uh, I think you might, you might be sending me one. <laughs> you, sure, absolutely. So I mean, in situations like that, again, it just goes back to the guys picking them. Are they good dudes? They know what they're talking about. They have a good palate, and the sticker is fun or not? It looks kind of cool. But I mean, how many of your in person buddies? Not as Brett referenced, not your online buddies that you talk about whiskey about to care about it. They want to come and drink your pappy. And that's, that's right. right. I think um, I think you you hit the nail on the head. The one thing that I I like about stickers is, is, is that your you, pictures on them. Well, <laughs> for the one for the two that I've been on, for somehow my face ends yeah. up on the side of them, which that's, that's why I like them because I can show people. I'm like, hey, look at this. I'm on the bottle. <laughs> I think it is cool. I mean, it, it is an opportunity to, to kind of capture the day. It's also an opportunity to sit there and uh, remember something about it, right? Whether there's, whether you say something or uh, somebody says something dumb and that becomes the name of the pick or whether the uh, a, a particular moment happened, um, you know, like when you think of Eddie's, Eddie's guard shack or sorry, uh, Jimmy's guard shack, that was a Russell Reserve pick that we did with Cork and Bottle. It was because they were driving in the truck through um, <laughs> the guard shack and Jimmy was just sitting there waiting for somebody to come pick him up. And they said, to hop on the truck, right? Like that's a, it's a, it's a tribute, it's a tribute. It's an, uh, of just something that happened that day that helps you remember it when you go back and you look at those stickers or you look at those tags or anything like that. So I, I do think it is kind of cool that, that those have kind of caught on a little bit. But I think the distilleries are in favor of what we're doing right now, talking about these stickers. And, and I think they also probably love the drama that these things create. I mean, the, the stuff that goes on with these, with the stickers and with the picks, it's hysterical. If you can sit back and just laugh at it, it's, 
it's incredible. I mean, the jealousy, the anger, the the hurt feelings, the reporting to the distilleries, the emails. I don't hope you. I hope you. You need to know that these these guys are doing this and to your bottle and like they care. I mean, they, they love it. <laughs> There's somebody who put a picture of Hulk and put Goik Smash on it. What's this mean? <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Before we get down into the uh, the nerd hole there, so let's 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 change it to a a different topic called uh, this. We're just going to call speculation here. So we, had, you had, Brett, you had kind of mentioned at the very beginning of the episode of talking about some of the store picks that are just kind of like no longer there, no longer available. Uh, things that you had mentioned, Van Winkle, which is never going to happen again. But things like Elmer, um, some other uh, store picks that you know we had we had never been around before. But when we just think about just say ETL in general, I mean, do you really think that Buffalo Trace is kind of creating this false sense of like oh, there's not enough that we can't do like? five barrels and it goes out to the most important customers that we have, or do you think they're really trying to just be fair? Like what's, what's your thought on that? I, you know, never really understood that with Elmer T. Lee. I mean, you, you, you know, I get that everything at Buffalo Trace is, is allocated, but I mean, what, what makes, what makes an Elmer T. I mean, Elmer T. Lee is a non-age, it's a great bourbon. I, I like it. I, it's non-age stated. I, I can't imagine that they couldn't make enough of it to do private picks if they wanted to. I don't quite get what that's all about. Um, you know, but nevertheless, I mean, you got, you got a bottle there, his, his, the, the death bottle, you've got, you know, a couple store picks that have been done. They go for tons of money. I I've had, look, I've had good barrels in Elmer, uh, you know, off the shelf that are great. I, I can't imagine paying up $200 for one of those special bottles. So I don't know why they don't do it. Uh, if they can do an OWA pick, why can't they do an Elmer? I, why is it? I, I've never understood why that's so, so much harder to make. Or even with that, like, I mean, of course, like there's a few, I guess you'd say unicorns that out there, like the, the Binnings, Weller 12 and uh, yeah. some of these other ones. But I mean, you, you kind of get this idea that, I don't know, I, I'll take a line that came from Fred Minnick that a lot of these people, or a lot of these companies are forgetting the ones who took them to the dance. They're forgetting about that guy who took them to the dance and they're getting, you know, they're trying to get a little bit too big for themselves and maybe they're not throwing a bone here or there uh, because I'm sure it wouldn't be hard to say like, we'll do one barrel of private Weller 12 for this particular person. Do you, do you think they, and Luke, I'll kind of get your, your opinion on this. Do you think they do that to not piss everybody off? Or do you think they do it because it, it really is like a, a shortage that they just want to save it all just for standard releases, or maybe it's just too much trouble for them. I, I think there's a little bit of all, everything you just said that weighs into it. I mean, there it's, I, from what I understand about the bottling lines, it's, it is a pain in the butt to do private picks. You got to shut it down. You got to clean out the gear. You got to send them through. You got to package and everything else separate. So it does interrupt their business flow. Um, I think part of it is they're going to sell it anyway, so they don't need to. I mean, Elmer's not something that sits anywhere. The last bottle I got was probably six months ago and it came out of the manager's office. So, you know, and, I, and I'm not unique in that regard. So, um, I, I just don't think that they have to, so they're not going to go through the hassle of doing it. Um, I don't know when the bourbon boom slows down, pops, fizzles, whatever it's going to be. At that point, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to sell those private picks as some of the harder things out again. But I mean, for the time being, I think it's just a matter of they're going to sell it anyway. Here's <laughs> something to consider for Buffalo Trace, though. When I was just out there, you guys were just there too. Uh, so they've got 16 warehouses now, and they're adding 30 more. So at what point are they going to have more than enough to do private picks with everything they want? In about six to eight years. <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe a little bit past that. <laughs> we, we might all have a little bit more gray hair uh, by then. Luke, I don't have to tell you, buddy. You're, yeah, it's but, already. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven Hill is going to have a ton to do for private picks because they just put up, what, three fifty thousand warehouses. So they're going to have a, a ton here coming up soon. Well, not Good. soon. Six to eight years. Yeah. And then, uh, so I guess, you know, following the Heaven Hill train, you know, I'll kind of get your, your side on that. Uh, either, you know, Brett or Luke, you can, you can answer, you know, they used to do some other private picks. I mean, we, there was been one that was a, a JTS Brown that was done by the silver dollar here. It was the only one that's ever been done. Uh, you used to see McKenna. Henry McKenna, Baldwin and Baldwin. Yeah, McKenna. You, used to, you used to see a lot of those. And, and now, yeah. Bernheims. Yeah. Cause I remember I had a lock and key that was in CF. That was a Bernheim. But now all you can see is Elijah Craig, uh, you know, Naz. So what what do you think is holding them back from doing something that appeals to more of this bourbon nerd market? Or do you think 
Luke, I mean, maybe you said the best, like shit, it's going to sell. Like why, why, why change it up? I think they're putting their uh, stock into Elijah Craig barrel proof. Um, seems like that release gets bigger and bigger. It's not hard to find anymore. And I'm happy about that. It's one of my, uh, and I know Brett agrees. It's one of my go-to daily drinkers. That's reliable. It's I always love it. And you can get it for 60, 70 bucks really consistently. So um, I think with limited supply, they're just going to focus on that. Um, the, the, I wouldn't mention which warehouse it's from because the, the whole world doesn't need to know, but Brett was part of a pretty legendary Elijah Craig pick. Um, I think they're going to be selective about which groups get to pick from which warehouses. And that's kind of the reward. It's not, it's not that they're going to let you have a 15 year barrel proof, anything, but maybe they'll let you go over to that other warehouse that nobody else gets to pick from and take a barrel. You said enough about that now. <laughs> <laughs> does it, does it rhyme with, with Schmeetsville? Deets- <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But one thing, I mean, people have to realize the the demand overseas is where all the stocks go on. It's going to these household brands like like Evan Williams Black and Buffalo Trail, like to the regular brands. That's where they're put, pumping all the resources to meet the demands over there. That's why there's a shortage of everything now because they've been pumping so much over there. And so once the the supply kind of gets built up. I think we're going to have a huge plethora of choices here in about eight years or so, but that's, that's my little inside knowledge is that that's what they tell me anyways. Well, yeah. And, and that's a good Ryan. That's a great segue into the uh, potential straight from the barrel uh, private picks that may be coming our way soon. Huh? <laughs> yes. We need to slip a few, we need to grease a few palms to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. That would be ideal. And so to, to, kind, to kind of tail off that one a little bit, you know, when you, when you think about, um, you know, how, how big these places are getting and, and the, a lot of their stock is being dumped into their their stuff that's hitting mass market. Why, why did they still even do single barrels? I mean, in your opinion, if 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 the bourbon's going to sell, what's the point of even doing single barrels anymore? So I kind of want to get your your thought of, of just the coming from a, a thought process of somebody that is in the industry uh, that is sitting behind the other side of the desk, like why, why would they want to still continue to do single barrels? Uh, I think that they have to, I think that there are, um, there are stores out there, uh, you know, Luke you mentioned Lincoln road, eight spirits. I mean, there's stores like that across the country. They need something different. They always need something different. I mean, you can't, you have to be able to offer private fix to people. And I think the distilleries know that and they've got to, They've got to continue to offer that to people. But they're also trying to appeal to all consumers. Um, I know when we get in our little bourbon bubble in our little communities, we think that everybody else cares about this stuff as much as we do, but they just don't. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, it's it's our little world. And so they need to sell a lot of Basil Hayden. They need to sell a lot of 90 proof, pretty watered down stuff to the mass consumers. And so they're going to, they're going to, that, and that's where they're spending all their marketing dollars. The four of us, if it's good, the four of us are going to find it and get it. Um, they don't need to advertise to us or market to us at all. We're going to figure it out because we spend way more time worried about this than is reasonable or acceptable. <laughs> most of the time. Well so, so, so it's it, really funny. I, go ahead, Luke. No, go ahead. It just reminded me of a funny story. I was watching Tombstone with my son the other day. And if you ever watch these old movies, they walk into a bar and they go up to the bar and they go, give me a whiskey. And that's it all there is it always gets me i mean no they're not, they're not specifying anything just give me a whiskey here you go great that's how it used to be yeah but yeah. the brands also recognize that there's less brand loyalty today where people are chasing authenticity and quality um i don't know about you guys but when i grew up my dad drank canadian club he that, that that's what he drank he always had it if the bar didn't have it he would leave the bar and he was a canadian club guy and now when people ask me and you guys could chime in with your response, I go, what's your favorite bourbon? That's like a 20 minute answer. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Yeah. Well, it depends on my mood. Do I have a good day, a bad day. Do I want, you know, so I, I just don't think there's that brand loyalty anymore. So they need to have all these different line extensions to capture the different people out there. You've never let your dad forget that. Have you? You couldn't drink old granddad, huh? I gave, <laughs> I gave him Pappy 20 year from 2011. Stitzel Weller. He took one sip and it's like, yeah, it's not as good as my stuff. <laughs> Never awesome. did that again. Oh man, that's pretty hardcore that he actually gave a bar. I don't 
I don't know if there'd be ever a drink there to be like, nah, can't I can't even drink here. That's that's <laughs> that's impressive. That's why. <laughs> He's grown up a little bit. I've kind of forced him to uh, try other things. So he likes Maker's Mark now. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I will give it to you. I mean, I, I think everybody kind of asks this, especially when you start talking to somebody and, and they'll, you know, we'll say, oh, yeah, I run a bourbon podcast. And what's the second question they ask? Well, it's your favorite bourbon. And yeah, it turns into like, oh, gosh, like, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, let's let's start. But I have to go back to my mind and look at my shelves and try to figure out what do I usually go to. So, yeah, you're right. There is there's not a lot of brand loyalty that does happen anymore. It was funny. Yeah, I was at dinner last week, some guys, and then they were like, I was telling them the bourbon podcast thing, and they're like, oh, can you tell what's in this bourbon and Coke? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Coke? <laughs> and they're like, can you tell if this is Woodford or Old Forester in this bourbon and Coke? And I was like, hell no. I was like, I, I have no idea. <laughs> it was a good store pick, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so so back to the store picks right here we'll kind of wrap it up and, and really we're going to talk a little bit about the experience uh, because I think that's that's something that uh, you know at least not everybody gets to go go on and go to you know as as more and more people crowd and flood these forums there's more people that are being aware of this they want to one day experience it so let's let's first just talk about the experience uh, and front met like ask he says when you taste a barrel, what's the first taste that either, you know, turns you on or turns you off of a pick? Is it sweet? Is it not sweet? Does it lack flavor? Or what makes you really excited about that particular barrel? Um, uh, okay. uh, go ahead, Ryan. Well, no way I was going, so I was like, I'll break the silence. Uh, <laughs> usually for me, it's the finish. Like, uh, you know, I like when something like, you know, it's kind of subtle on the front end, but in the back end, it just like, pow hits you that's what excites me whenever i i, I kind of start tasting through barrels yeah I, I, I for like, me i like, yeah, I like uh sorry i uh i like something that hits you a little bit up front does the old kentucky hug but i like a like a super long finish and uh I, the complexity is what really gets it for me it's got to have some depth to it and kind of fill your mouth i if it's thin and just kind of goes through and 10 seconds later you're like what the hell just happened i don't taste anything anymore that's a, I'm done. I won't have another sip of that usually. I usually, the day before I'll, I'll, whatever the pick is, I'll, I'll, I'll drink a little bit of the, whatever the standard release is and really kind of get a baseline. And I really want to try idea. something. I want to find something different. And so, you know, you kind of come in with that, you, you got that flavor fresh in your mind and you want something diff very different from that, but good still. I mean, some, like we talked about earlier, sometimes it's not. And so you kind of have to make a choice. Do I want a really good representation of some pick? I want something just crazy off the wall different. And so I, I'm looking for something different that's, that's still really, really good. Because at the end of the day, I mean, who cares if, it's, if it tastes like every other bottle you can get or every other pick that's done. I mean, I want something that people try and they go, wow, that's great. Where can I get that? You really can't. I yeah. mean, it's unique. So, you know, go pick your own. I think Kenny and I are on the same line. It's funny, the burp, the – buffalo trace pick we did you know the guys all we all like two but one was like really off profile and one was kind of like this tastes like a buffalo trace and we're like all right well what are we going for do we want a standard buffalo trace or we want something that's going to be unique so yeah i'm with you that so i guess brett I'll, I'll throw another question at your way since you try to taste the baseline the night before why don't you do it in the parking lot? You know, that's what I'd say. I'd say I should bring a, <laughs> just bring a flask in at that point and just like just do a little thing here on the side so you can really see if you're 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 able to tell the difference. That's not a bad idea. It's just if you go to Buffalo Trace, make sure you bring extra glasses because there won't be enough to go around. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Fair point. And and so that'll kind of lead into the the last question here, which it doesn't really matter which distillery you're going to, whether it's Buffalo Trace or Wild Turkey or 1792 or uh, pick any one. Uh, it could be uh, anyone here but michael urato asked are there any words of wisdom or tricks of the trade when it comes to going on your first barrel pick for me okay. it's, it's like sure. take it easy don't drink too much because it's it's easy meditate before so you, yeah you don't like go too crazy <laughs> I, I i think that probably what there's a couple tips i would give that i learned um one is I would step outside if you can when you're tasting. And, and I think that when you're in the warehouse, you can be overwhelmed by the smell and it can really affect how you're, how you're evaluating something. I think that another piece of advice I would give is uh, 
I would try all of them on your own and rate them all on your own before you share your opinions with anybody else. You know, right or wrong, I, I don't, I think it's very, we've all seen it's incredibly easy to get influenced, not only by the bottle you're holding, but by what the guy next to you says. And everyone goes into these the first time very insecure. They don't, you know, they don't know how their palate is. They don't know if they, if they're good enough. They don't know if they're going to pick a good, but, but everybody tastes differently. And I think you need to evaluate it on your own and see, you know, then see uh, how, what everyone else thinks. I think that's the best way to do it. So you don't sneak in your own ice cubes to test with it? Is that true? No. How would you do that? <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is on Coke. Yeah, there you go. Uh, for me, it's try not to be too hungover. I mean, you get to, if you haven't been to the world before. For you. You know, yeah, <laughs> times, but uh, I've managed. Um, Louisville's an exciting town. There's a lot of cool things to see, the cool bars to hang out at. So it will affect your ability to taste them the next morning. So try to take it easy. Get some food in your belly so that way if you're going to go to like a wild turkey where you're going to get to taste eight barrels, by the seventh, you're just – you're, you're going to be done. You're not going to be able to taste anything and you're probably going to have a good buzz going. So um, – and just sip. Um, the other thing I always tell people because I host a lot of tastings, um, you know, breathe – taste with your mouth open or smell with your mouth open. You can't taste it with your mouth open. That would be kind of hard. But uh, <laughs> I was going to say something. I saw that coming. Uh, but smell with your mouth open. Take your time. There's no rush. And uh, ask a lot of questions uh, because the people that are hosting the event, um, they do them all the time. A lot of them get really bored and they get engaged and they start to care if you bring them into it. So ask them questions. If they are in a bad mood that they find, ask them some more and uh, <laughs> try to tap their knowledge because they don't put bad people in those rooms that don't know what they're doing. So if you can tap that knowledge, I think that's important. See, my advice would be to get as hungover as possible. Kind of go hit Lola's till about 1 a.m. Uh, <laughs> the night before. No. No. <laughs> what these guys said is totally spot on. Like you said, Kenny, mine is like – this is one of my favorite things to do of all time is go pick barrels. Like I get so excited for each one. Like I'm almost too amped up. You know, you're like – you get there and you're all giddy and like everybody's having a good time. You're like – all right, and you're you're sitting there drinking and talking, and then you forget. So for me, anyways, you forget that you're even picking. You're like, oh wait, I gotta pick something, <laughs> you know. So it's uh, just enjoy it, you know. It's that's the fun part is going and hanging out with your friends and whoever's going. Just have a good time and talk to the people there. Just enjoy the moment because that's like it's one of the coolest things you'll ever do, or at least that I've done, anyways. I think we forget that Ryan is at the end of the day, it's all about fun, and that's what the whole that's what bourbon's for, anyway. Yeah, for sure. hundred percent. I always try to soak in the kind of the experience too. I mean, you walk in again, wild Turkey, you walk in that you're in, if you're in warehouse, I think it's H I think it was built in like 1892 or something like that. And it's a, a way to add to the experience. And it kind of gives you a sense of how cool it is, what you're doing right there and how many people have gotten to do that. I know at least that warehouse, um, it does not have an electrical outlet except for the <laughs> no. one outside. There's yeah. one outside in the whole we can, damn warehouse. <laughs> we can we can tell you that for a fact because we recorded a podcast there and it's an absolute pain in the ass. So yeah, <laughs> yeah don't try to record podcasts when you're doing your your pick. <laughs> so uh, that's good, and I think uh, that we can always round it out here by by circling back and saying it's you should always have fun with this. Uh, but as Brett has already pointed out, out, that you can pick a bad barrel, so don't screw it up too bad, right? <laughs> no pressure yeah no pressure so guys i want to say thank you again this was a fun conversation just talking about barrel picks uh it was it was really and really enjoyable but i want to let you all uh just kind of give a plug for yourselves where people can find you uh whether it's online on twitter on instagram uh facebook give a plug for bourbon and banter so go ahead and, and go for it uh, you can read read our stuff on at bourbon and uh i'm on twitter uh, and Instagram at Brett Atlas uh, on Facebook too. Um, yeah, come check us out. Yep, bourbonbanter.com, Twitter um, Castle, at Castle44, and uh, Instagram El Castle Grande. I'm, uh, I'm a lot taller when I'm not sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, Brian with sipping corn. <laughs> he up to the barrel pick. He's like eight foot tall. I was gonna yeah, he, is, he is very tall. <laughs> Well, we guys have to have a, a face off one day. So that's, that's good. So fellows, again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, for anybody else, uh, you know, make sure you follow these guys on social media. Make sure you also follow us as well. 
Follow Bourbon Pursuit on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Bourbon Pursuit. If you do like what you hear, please make sure you support the show. You can go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. Uh, and I want to say thank you for everybody from our Patreon members that are actually here listening in the chat. We had about 10 people on. We had a lot of people sitting here joining and asking questions along with this as well. So that's another perk for being a Patreon member is you can actually sit here and be a part of these recordings. Uh, so Ryan, go ahead and close us out. Yeah, thanks, guys. That that was super fun. That, like I said, as you people could tell, I get really excited about barrel picks and doing the the whole experience is great. I hope everyone gets to at least do one in their lifetime, and I'm looking forward to more burn pursuit ones with Kenny. And uh, looking that, that they're awesome. But I have a public service announcement because my grandfather, who was nine or eighty four, passed away, and he was a big bourbon collector. And never opened anything because he said it was the good stuff, you know, the nice stuff. These are selling shells. We passed away and we never got to drink them together. And it's such a shame. And like now we have all these bottles and our family's going to get to enjoy them. But I just wish we could have enjoyed them together. So remember, guys, all these bottles, they're not trophies. They can be for sale, but just try to enjoy them. I mean, that's what it's all about. So anyways, see you next time. <laughs> You're here.